Heritage Group. So follow along with me as I read. Uh, yeah, you can do whatever you want to. It's yours to keep. Um, follow along with me as I read. We'll stop as we get to uh, questions. We'll go through more than half of this before I just turn it over to you to finish, okay? Uh, hi, Sabian and whoever else is out there. We miss you. Hope you're feeling better. Uh, so what is apologetics? Defining apologetics. Apologetics may be simply defined as the defense of the Christian faith. The simplicity of this definition, however, masks the complexity of the problem of defining apologetics. It turns out that a diversity of approaches has been taken to defining uh, taken to defining the meaning, scope, and purpose of apologetics. So what's the simple definition of apologetics? The defense of the Christian faith. In the next, uh, from apologia or apologia to apologetics. The word apologetics derives from the Greek word apologia, which is, was originally used of a speech of defense or an answer given in reply. In ancient Athens, it referred to a defense made in the courtroom as part of the normal judi judicial procedure. After the accusation, the defendant was allowed to refute the charges with a defense or reply, apologia. The, accu the accused would attempt to speak away, apo, away, logia, speech, the accusation. The classic example of an uh, apologia was Socrates' defense against the charge of preaching strange gods, a defense retold by his most famous pu pupil, Plato, in, dialogue, in a dialogue called the Apology, in Greek, a apologio. So... Uh, what did uh, Apologio refer to in uh, ancient Athens? Okay, so a speech of defense in reply in the court. A speech of defense or in reply in a court. So someone's been charged with something, and before the sentence is pronounced, that person has the opportunity to defend him or herself, to speak on their own behalf. So a speech of defense, a court. So in the Greek, the prefix apo means what? Away, and the root logia means? Speech. Speech. So, to, so uh, uh, apologia means to speak away. Now, literally is what it means. Now, we're going to look at these Bible verses, and um, I'm going to have you guys read some of them, or read them out loud. Some of you read them out loud, and uh, then we'll figure out which English word, because obviously all these New Testament passages were written in the Greek, which English word was translated from apologia in each of these? So let's start with Acts, Acts 19.33. Who wants to read that? Go ahead, man. Thank you. Some of the crowd promoted Alexander, whom Jews had put forward, and Alexander mentioned with his hand wanting to make wanted to make a defense to the crowd. Okay, so let me give you a little background here. Um, Paul is in Ephesus, and the silver makers, the people that made idols, got mad at him because people were becoming Christians, and so they were no longer buying their idols. And there was, watch, there was such a, I don't know, outbreak, there was such a kerfuffle uh, that the town's um, clerk had to come and settle everybody down. So then here in verse 33, as Malan just read, some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward, and Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. What word in there is apologia? Defense. Yeah, the word that uh, is, uh, and, and the, the noun form is apologia, the verb form is apologia name. 
So now turn to Second uh, Corinthians twelve nineteen. 2 Corinthians twelve nineteen. And who wants to read? Go ahead, Kyle. Thank you. I do believe that we are all one. We have been defending ourselves to you, and it is in the Son of God that we have been speaking in Christ and follow. Okay, so which word in there do you think is from um, apologia? In this case, it's actually apologia. Defending. Defending. Are, do you think we are defending ourselves? In a way. And then 2 Corinthians 7, verse 11. Mary? For see what, yeah, yeah, okay. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourself, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal. At every point, you have proved, proved yourself innocent in the matter. Okay, so this one's a little bit more difficult. Just a little background. You may remember this. I think I talked about this last year. Maybe I don't know. So there were four Corinthian letters. Two were lost. There was a first letter. Then there was the one that we call First Corinthians. There was what is called the severe letter. And then there's Second Corinthians. The Corinthian church was messed in your life. It was it was totally messed up. And so um, Paul's first three letters were trying to get them to see the sin in their church. And there was big sin in their church. And it took a visit, took two visits and three letters, but they finally repented. And 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians is the response to that repentance. So as he, as he says in, in verse 11, um, yeah. So, I'll, okay, foresee what earnestness this godly grief, so they were grieved by their sin, has produced, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, indignation against sin, by the way, what zeal, what punishment. At every point, you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. So, uh, what do you think is the word? No, that's a good guess, but that's not it. Proved. The word proved. You've apologied. Apologied yourself. You have cleared yourself. You have defended yourself. And then Romans 2. That one. Thank you. Know that word other conscience and prayers to their conflict and thoughts and views or even Okay, hey, where's the apology of there? No, accuse is not to make a defense. Accuse is to make an accusation, right? And, <coughs> and to, to defend is to defend against the accusation. Excuse, right. So rather than being excused, they're defended. They've made a defense. They've excused themselves. And then 2 Timothy 4.16. 2 Timothy, by the way, um, is the last thing we have of Paul's writings. Uh, Paul was in prison uh, for the last time. In Rome, he's going to be martyred. He knows he's going to be martyred. And this is for a passionate guy. Uh, and Paul was a passionate guy. This is the most passionate writing of his. Uh, it's very, um, very moving. So verse 16, what does verse 16 of, of 2 Timothy 4 tell us? Yes. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against me. So at his first trial, nobody came to uh, to help him. But what word is used there for trial? Defense. At my first apologia, nobody came and stood by me. 
So the word there is defense. Okay, now we're going to move ahead. The word appeared 17 times in noun or verb form in the New Testament. So go ahead and write the answer to that. And both the noun, apologia, and the verb form, apologia may, can be translated defense or vindication in every case. So how is it usually used in the New Testament? Defense or vindication. What's vindication? To be made, to be declared uh, not guilty. If you're vindicated, like if I accuse you of, you know, smacking. Mary on the head, and you didn't do it, and you prove you didn't do it, you're vindicated. Don't smack her. She probably wouldn't. Yeah. 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 Uh, so that's what vindication means. Okay, so um, usually the word is used to refer to a speech made in one's own defense. For example, in one passage, Luke says that in Acts, uh, we just read it, that a Jew named Alexander tried to make a defense before an angry crowd. Uh, in, Ephes or, uh, in Ephesus that uh, was incited by idol makers whose business was threatened by Paul's preaching. Elsewhere, Luke always uses the word in reference to situations in which Christians, and in particular the Apostle Paul, are putting on, uh, put on trial for proclaiming their faith in Christ and have to defend their message against the charge of being unlawful. I was in, um, I was in Acts 21 or 22 this morning. And Paul gives a defense of the faith, and he's going to give another defense of the faith in the next chapter. Um, Paul put himself, uh, Paul was used to, uh, excuse me, Paul himself used the word in a variety of contexts in his epistles. To the Corinthians, he found it necessary to defend himself against criticisms of his claims to be an apostle before they, uh, before they, uh, and came back. At one point, he describes the repentance exhibited by, exhibited by the Corinthians as a vindication, that is, as an eagerness to clear yourselves. To the Romans, Paul described Gentiles who did not have the written law as being aware enough of God's law that depending on their behavior, their own thoughts will either prosecute or defend them on judgment day. Toward the end of his life, Paul told Timothy, at my first defense, no one supported me, referring to the first time he stood trial. Paul's usage here is similar to what we find in Luke's writings. Earlier, he had expressed his appreciation for the Philippians for supporting him both in his imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Here again, the context is Paul's conflict with the government and his imprisonment. However, the focus of the defense is not Paul, but the gospel. He's defending not, not himself, defending the gospel. Paul's ministry includes defending the gospel against its detractors, especially those who claim that it is subversive in any way or in any way unlawful. So Paul says later in the chapter, I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. Finally, in 1 Peter 3.15, believers are told to always be prepared to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. The context here is similar to Paul's later epistles and to Luke's writings. Non-Christians are slandering the behavior of Christians and threatening them with persecution. When challenged or even threatened, Christians are to behave lawfully, maintain a good conscience, and give a reasoned defense of what they believe to anyone who asks. The New Testament then does not use the words apology and apology may in the technical sense of the modern word apologetics. The idea of offering a reasoned defense of the faith is evident in three of these texts, Philippians and especially Peter. But even here, no science or formal academic discipline of apologetics is contemplated. Indeed, no specific system or theory of apologetics is outlined in the New Testament. In the second century, this general word for defense began to take on a narrower, narrower sense to refer to a group of writers who defended the beliefs and practices of Christianity against various attacks. These men were known as apologists as of the titles, because of the titles of some of their treatises, and included most notably Justin Martyr, and he wrote First Apology, Dialogue with Trifo, and Second Apology, and Tertullian, who wrote Apologetic. 
the use of the uh, of of the title apology by these authors harks back to Plato's apology and to the words usual sense in the New Testament and is consistent with the fact that the emphasis of these second century apologies was on defending Christians against charges of illegal activities. It was not apparently and it was apparently not until 1794 that apologetics was used to designate a specific theological discipline. And there has been debate about the place of the discipline in Christian thought almost from that time forward. Uh, so I'm going to end there for now, and then I'm going to have you pick up where it says apologetics and related terms. Because that, that, if you want to read it, read it. But it's pretty technical, and it's not something we'll touch on in this class uh, because it's so technical. So begin with apologetics and related terms. Finish reading. Finish answering these questions. If you get it done um, before, um, if you get it done before the class is over, then um, you can turn it in. If you don't, uh, it's tomorrow that's on the board. Okay. Wilson one